Jeremiah chapter 28. I'm just going to jump right in it, explain as we make our way along. Verse 1. And it happened in the same year at the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year and in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet, who was from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord in the presence of the priests and of all the people, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two full years I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. And I will bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah who went to Babylon, says the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. The kingdom of Judah was ruled by the house of David. It was the descendants of King David who sat on the throne. And some of them were very godly men, but some of them were wicked men. And because of wickedness of the kings, and because especially of the wickedness of the people and their refusal to listen to God, God had appointed that judgment would come upon the kingdom of Judah. Now, whenever God sends judgment, he gives lots of warnings. Aren't you happy about that? God is a gracious God. And he just doesn't judge, or should I say, he rarely judges. I, I won't say that God never does certain things, because he's God. He can do what he wants to do. But God's normal pattern is to give warnings before he judges. And he gave warnings repeatedly through the prophet Jeremiah to the kingdom of Judah. Repent, Jeremiah said. You guys are on the wrong track. Change your mind. Change your life. You guys better change because judgment's coming. Eventually, judgment came just as Jeremiah prophesied. But it didn't come in one great blow. It didn't come like with one mighty sledgehammer. It came like with three blows of a smaller hammer. The first one came when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came and invaded Judah and overwhelmed the city of Jerusalem and took away a bunch of captives. Then some years later, Nebuchadnezzar came back and he invaded Judah again. And he established some order and he kicked out a king and he took him back to Babylon and set up another king. And then that went on for some time. And then about, oh, about 11 years after that, he came back a final time. Jeremiah writes this, in between the second and the third invasions of the Babylonians. Judah's in trouble, but they're still hanging on by a thread, and they haven't mended their ways. Now, what God told Judah to do through the prophet Jeremiah was surrender to the judgment. It's too far gone. I'm bringing the judgment. Don't fight it. Submit yourself to Nebuchadnezzar. Matter of fact, there was a time in this period, it's described in the previous chapter of Jeremiah, and we took a look at it last week. You could listen to the tape, or nobody uses tape anymore. You know what I mean. It's a figure of speech. You, you, you can listen to it from last week, and, and it explains to you how simply uh, there was a group of envoys, of messengers from the neighboring kingdoms around Judah who had come to Jerusalem because it seemed that Nebuchadnezzar's power was weakening. There was a revolt in this part of his empire. There was other trouble in this part of the empire. There was the whole thing of maybe Nebuchadnezzar's not on his game. Now's the time to revolt. And you know what Jeremiah did? Jeremiah did something really remarkable. He came and spoke to King Zedekiah, and he came and spoke in the presence of all those other envoys wearing the yoke of an oxen. Can you picture that in your mind? A man walking around wearing a yoke of an oxen. And he said... Here's the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar. Put it on and wear it. You're not going to break free from this. And it was a lesson made with an illustration. Well, friends, this is what I want you to understand. That this man named Hananiah the prophet that's described for us in verse 1, he was a false prophet who opposed the message of Jeremiah. Matter of fact, he flat out contradicted it. You see, when Jeremiah said, submit yourself to the king of Babylon, submit yourself to your yoke, Hananiah didn't listen. Hananiah said, no, God's message is just the opposite. Verse 2, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. This is what Hananiah said, and he said it in the name of the Lord. He said, thus saith the Lord, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is going down. Now's your chance 
to revolt against him. Matter of fact, Hananiah got even more specific. If you take a look at verse 3, he says, I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house. Now, please understand, Hananiah is speaking in the voice of the Lord. So when he says, I will bring back, he means the Lord will bring back. All those gold and silver and precious articles that are used in the temple services that were taken away by Babylon, they're coming back. That was the good news that Hananiah brought. And then Hananiah said, verse 4, that King Jeconiah would return. He was the one that was deposed and taken away to Babylon. And look at verse 3, or excuse me, verse 4, and all the captives of Judah who went to Babylon, all of them. Good news, everybody. Captivity's over. The king's coming back. The the things from the temple are coming back. We're going to win. This is great. And if you look at verse uh, uh, 3 there, this is the most interesting. He said it would happen within two full years. Hananiah did the thing that smart false prophets never do. He put an expiration date on the prophecy. Smart false prophets, and I am I supposed to use air quotes when I say smart? <laughs> smart, so to speak, false prophets. No, you don't put a time date on it because then people can objectively call you on it. But he did. He said, within two years, captivity's over, exile's over, we're all coming home. Now look, I just got to say, here's Jeremiah's message. Submit to Nebuchadnezzar. We're not getting out of this. God will bring us back in due time, but not now. You have Hananiah's message. Happy days are here again, and Nebuchadnezzar's going down. Friends, can we just agree on something? They cannot both be speaking truly from the Lord. Do we agree on that? Now, look, it's possible that they're both wrong. Isn't that true? It could be. But there's no way that they can both be right. And likely, Jeremiah, you're right, or Hananiah, you're right. Well, how's this going to work out? Take a look here at verse 5. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and in the presence of all the people who stood in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen! The Lord do so. The Lord perform your words which you have prophesied to bring back the vessels of the Lord's house and all who are carried away captive from Babylon to this place. First thing I want you to notice, Jeremiah challenged the false prophet of Hananiah. I suppose he didn't have to. Jeremiah could have just gone home, but he didn't. So that man is speaking falsely in the name of the Lord. I'm going to call him out. And he called him out. By the way, we know that this was done publicly. It was done there on the Temple Mount. Hananiah was making a public... Well, look, let's understand this. Hananiah called out Jeremiah first, and Jeremiah responded to what Hananiah did. What Jeremiah did was no different than what Hananiah did. He's just simply responding to it. But the second thing I want you to notice in this is I want you to notice what he says. He says in verse 6, Amen, the Lord do so. I wonder, and I genuinely wonder this, how sarcastic Jeremiah was being. Because part of it, I think, wasn't sarcastic. Friends, do you think Jeremiah liked preaching the message of judgment? Woo-hoo, I get to tell everybody today that there's going to be death and destruction all over Judah. Friends, there was a big part of Jeremiah that genuinely wished a man like Hananiah was right. But listen, if judgment really is coming, all the false prophets in the world isn't going to erase that. If judgment really is coming, all the happy thoughts in the world aren't going to take it away. Positive thinking isn't going to turn away the judgment of God. And I think there was a big part of, of uh, Jeremiah that was being sincere here. I wish it was true, Hananiah. From your lips to God's ears. But it's not going to happen like that. I know it. He continues on, verse 7. Nevertheless, by the way, that's a big word there, isn't it? Nevertheless. I wish you were right, but you're not. Nevertheless, hear now this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who have been before me And before you of old prophesied against many countries and great kingdoms of war and disaster and pestilence. That's for the prophets who prophesied of peace. When the word of the prophet comes to pass, 
the prophet will be known as the one whom the Lord has truly sent. The first thing that Jeremiah says, because listen, Hananiah, that's a wonderful message. Wow, very positive. You get the positive thinking award. Good for you. But let's be honest. You're not really walking in the tradition of the previous prophets. When I think of the prophets that preceded us, men like Micah and Amos and Isaiah and other people, great prophets of God who came before the time of Jeremiah and Hananiah, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them had very stern messages of judgment. Says, Isn't this true? Many of the prophets we respect brought a message of judgment. And so he also adds in verse 9, as for the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, then we'll believe it. All right, you say everything's going to be good within two years? Hananiah, put up or shut up? Let's see how it's going to work out. Well, Hananiah apparently didn't like this because look at verse 10. Then Hananiah took the yoke off the prophet Jeremiah's neck and broke it. All right, the first thing that just amazes me about this, Jeremiah was still wearing the yoke. Friends, chapter 27, verse 1, tells us that this happened in the fourth month that he spoke to the, the envoys from the other nations. In the fourth month, he put on the yoke. On the fifth month, he's still wearing it around the temple courts. I hope God doesn't ask me to do anything like he asked Jeremiah to do. You know, it, it'd be like, go put on this suit of armor and walk up and down State Street, you know, as an example. Je Jeremiah was wearing the yoke. I don't know if everybody just got used to, oh, there's Jeremiah. Yeah, wearing the yoke again. I, I wonder if it became a fashion statement. If other people started wearing yokes around the temple courts. No, I don't think so. Because Hananiah was so mad that what he was so mad at the prophet Jeremiah that he wrestled the yoke from him. And I don't know how he broke it. I, I don't think he could just break it over your leg. He probably just smashed it to the ground and he broke it as a way of saying, no way, Jeremiah. Matter of fact, he, he meant something very plain by it. Look at it right here uh, in, in verse 11. And Hananiah spoke in the presence of all the people saying, thus says the Lord, even so I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all the nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. Now, I'll give you this. That Hananiah, he knew how to preach a sermon. What great illustrations, isn't it? Hananiah's whole message was that the yoke that Nebuchadnezzar put upon not only Judah but the surrounding nations, that that yoke was over and Nebuchadnezzar was going down and they would be free. You, you understand what the whole picture is of a yoke, isn't it? You're in servitude. The ox that wears the yoke, he's not exactly free to do whatever he wants to do. He has to pull the plow of the owner. And what he was saying is, we're free. God, in the name of God, God has broken the yoke. Isn't it a powerful illustration? And I bet everybody said, ooh, wow. The other thing I want you to see was not only was this a very dramatic and powerful message, I have the feeling, and don't you, that Hannah and I really believed it. Don't you have the feel from this that this was a man sold out to his message? I mean, if you're going to do this publicly, you believe it. I, I bet if you hooked him up to the lie detector, I bet if you shine the bright light in his eyes, Hannah and I, do you really believe that, that God has broken the yoke of the king of Babylon? Absolutely, I believe it. I believe it with all my heart. But friends, none of that made it true. And in fact, it was not true. So what did Jeremiah do? Verse 11, the prophet Jeremiah went his way. I just want you to get a feel for this. By all estimation, anybody who was watching this little exchange between Jeremiah and Hananiah at the temple, they would have thought that Hananiah won the day. Well, we know who won that debate. Get out of here, Mr. Broken Yoke. Pick up your yoke and walk. Get out of here. He's the winner. He, he, he really bested you in this one. You see, Hananiah seemed to overpower Jeremiah. He seemed to have the last word. And Jeremiah walked away without a response. But in this case, appearances were not true. 
and neither was Hananiah. Look at the response here coming up into verse 12. Now the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, You have broken the yokes of wood, but you have made in their place yokes of iron. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron on the neck of these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. I have given him the beasts of the field also. Did you see that in verse 13? Jeremiah, you go tell Hananiah, yeah, you're pretty good at breaking wooden yokes. What about the yokes of iron that you've put on? You have broken the yokes of wood, but you have made in their place yokes of iron. When he came back and confronted Hananiah again, he he broke the wood as a prophetic illustration, but he could never break the yokes of iron that God would set upon those who opposed him and opposed Nebuchadnezzar. There's a few things I want you to understand about this. Number one, the yokes of iron can be understood as God's stricter discipline upon his people. What do I mean by that? Look, we as believers, and friends, I, I hope I don't say this with any harshness in my voice or in my heart, but we as believers can slip into sin, into spiritual decline. It's possible. And when that happens, a loving God tries to get our attention. Why? Because he hates us? Because he's mad at us? No, because he loves you. Because you are like a son or a daughter to him, and he cares about you. And if he needs to discipline you, if, according to the, uh, the, the pattern of child raising, if he needs to spank you, to, to teach you, he'll do it from time to time. But here's the point. If you ignore or break the yoke of wood that God puts upon you to teach you, You know what you just made for yourself? A yoke of iron. Friends, may God give me the grace. Do you mind if I include you in that prayer as well? May God give us the grace to respond to his correction and discipline early. Lord, if I gotta wear a yoke of discipline, I'd much rather it be the yoke of wood than the yoke of iron. That's one aspect of it. But there's another aspect of this I'd like you to consider. The yokes of iron may also be expressed in sinful habits that we allow to enslave us. In other words, put it to you this way. God gives us a yoke of wood. And friends, yokes were made out of wood. A yoke of iron is unnatural. Nobody would look at, hey, look, he's pulling the yoke of iron. Yoke of iron, why don't you waste good iron on that? Use wood. It's more comfortable for the animal. It's better. It's just that's what we make yokes out of. God has a yoke for every one of us to bear. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden's light. Jesus wants to put on you a, a yoke that's perfectly fitted for you. But sometimes we, as his children, we reject it. We say, well, no, I don't want to be... I don't want to be hassled by this service to God. You know, it's so confining. I'd much rather have the freedom. Friends, when you reject God's authority over you and go your own way, here's just a, does it make you more free or less free? Go around and uh, ask the person who's lost in their addictions. Ask them how free they are. Ask a person who's addicted to whatever. Ask a person whose life has blown up. Ask a person who used to have a lot of choices in their life, but because of their sinful habits, now they have very few choices. And see what happens? You can cast off the yoke that God graciously gives you, and in return, you're going to wear a yoke of iron. I, I like what Alexander McLaren said. He said, do you think it will be easy to serve those base-born parts of your nature when you've set them on the throne and tell them to govern you? 
Make sex your God. Go ahead, put it on the throne of your life. Do you think it's a gracious master to you? Make money your God. Go ahead, just do it. Put it on the throne of your life. Do you think money is going to be a kind master to you? The the praise of man, is that going to be a kind master? On and on and I could just keep going, but you get the idea, don't you? Like, oh Lord, I would much rather be your slave than anything else. Don't give me the yoke of iron, Lord. Verse 15. Then the prophet Jeremiah said to Hananiah, the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, but you make this people trust in a lie. Therefore says the Lord, Behold, I will cast you from the face of the earth. This year you shall die because you have taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. Verse 15. Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, but you make this people trust a lie. You know, when I read the story of Hananiah, I tend to be fairly sympathetic to him. I look at Hananiah, and I generally see a well-intentioned man who got the message wrong. He meant well. He really thought he was helping the people of Judah. He saw how people were encouraged by his message of hope and success. You know, he he meant really well and all that. That, That's kind of the generosity I want to give to Hannah and I. I want you to notice, God doesn't give him that generosity. What does God say to him? You're lying. You're making my people trust in a lie. And he says, you have taught them rebellion against the Lord, verse 16. All I can say is that God's message to Hannah and I was not, well, you you meant well, so keep trying. Because you're a false prophet. You're telling the people of God exactly what they do not need to hear. And you'll suffer for it. You're going to die, Hananiah. You know, I I think it's interesting how Hananiah, to his credit, was bold enough to put an expiration date on his prophecy. God says, you know what? You're not even going to make it to that expiration date. It says there in verse 16, I believe, that he died, or maybe it's 17, in the seventh month. Did you see when this prophecy began? In the fifth month. Hananiah said two years. God said, no, two months, and you're gone. That's how it worked. And Hananiah was gone from the scene. Chapter 29, verse 1. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. This happened after Jeconiah the king, the queen mother, and the eunuchs, the princes of Judah, and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, to Gemira, the son of Hilkah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, and this is the beginning of the letter, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Jeremiah chapter 29 contains a letter, a letter that was written by God, even though Jeremiah was the penman, the letter was from God through the prophet Jeremiah, a letter from Jeremiah and God to the exiles who were already in Babylon. I I told you before, that Babylon conquered Judah in waves in three successive attacks. Well, in the first attack, people got carried away. In the second people attack, people got carried away. These are people who got carried away in the first and the second attacks. They're already in Babylon. Jeremiah and the survivors are still in Jerusalem. Does everybody have that picture? So he writes a picture to the... Uh, writes a picture. He writes a letter to those who are already in exile. Now... It's important for me to bring this up. There are people today, and uh, I think there's something to this. I think there's something for us to think about this in the Christian world. There are people today who say that we as Christians in the Western world should start considering ourselves to be believers in exile. In other words, we thought that perhaps we could have a greatly beneficial influence on the society and that we could 
Can everybody understand I'm going to speak in metaphors here? I just hope you'll catch it. Okay, here's the metaphors. We thought we were building Jerusalem, the city of God, but now we find ourselves in Babylon in exile. The culture says, we don't want you. You're not in power. You're out of power. You can live among us as the Jews lived among the exiles and uh, lived among the Babylonians. You can live among us. We're not going to wipe you out. But let's make it clear. You're not in power. You don't dictate how things go here. You're in Babylon. Now, th there are people who suggest that this is the mentality that Christians sh should start adopting, and we should learn how to live in exile. L let me say, I don't know exactly what to think about that. I think it's intriguing. I'm, I'm thinking through it. I think there's something there. I don't know how much, but let me just say, if that is the case, there's a lot for us to learn from this letter to exiles in Jeremiah chapter 29. There's a lot for us to learn. So this happened after this people were taken away into captivity and God is speaking, verse 4, to all who were carried away captive. Look at what he has to say starting at verse 5. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give to your daughters husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it. For its peace, for in its peace you will have peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams, which you have caused to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. Do you see what God's message to the exiles was? L look at there at verse 5. The first thing he tells them is, build houses and dwell in them. Hey, hey, exiles, you thought that you might be there just a few months. Just, what's the use of building a house if I'm only going to be here a few months? God's going to take us back to Judah. Hey, hey, exiles, there's prophets telling you, oh, Nebuchadnezzar's going down. His yoke is going to be broken. You're going to be set free. Woo, don't build a house. Don't start a business. Don't build a family. You're going back to Judah. This was God's message through the prophet of Jeremiah. Forget about that. You're staying in Babylon a good long time. Later in the chapter, he's going to give the figure to be 70 years. Now, is 70 years a long time? I don't know. Ask somebody who's 70 years old. 70 years is a long time. It's not a short time, but neither is it forever, not by any means. So Jeremiah says, you're going to be there long enough to where you should just settle in and make the best of what you have. Build houses, dwell in them. Verse 6, that you may be increased there and not diminished. Marry, multiply. I want my people to, to expand. I want them to, to grow together as a people. Just as the people of God increased when they were in Egypt, so you can increase now in Babylon. God wants that. And then he says in verse 7, this is really interesting, seek the peace of the city where I've caused you to be carried away captive. God didn't tell them, bring Nebuchadnezzar down from the inside. Start little, you know, resistance factions and look to see what you can do. That was not God's message to these exiles. He said, listen, pray for them, seek peace for them, be a good neighbor, be a good citizen, be kind to your Babylonian friends and neighbors. Ultimately, God has caused you. Look at that in verse 7. Where I have caused you to be carried away captive. God caused them to be in Babylon and they should be a blessing in the place where they were set. And then he says in verse 8, do not let your prophets and diviners who are in your midst deceive you. You see, there were false prophets among the Jews in Jerusalem, like Hananiah, but there were also false prophets among the Jewish people in Babylon. And the false prophets among the Jewish people in Babylon in exile said, we're going to be here just a few more months. Get ready to go. Start packing your bags. God says, no, you're going to be there 70 years. Verse 9 they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them. Now look here, starting at verse 10. For thus says the Lord, 
after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place where I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. First thing, verse 10 after 70 years. Again, do you get the feel of 70 years? It's a long time, but it's not forever. Jewish people in exile, you will come back to the promised land, but not for a while, so settle in. Does everybody get the idea there are 70 years? But by the way, and this is just parenthetical, Daniel believed this promise of 70 years, and when 70 years was about to approach, Daniel started praying and say, Lord, fulfill your promise. And it was fulfilled. So they really believed this promise of 70 years, and it was, in fact, fulfilled. Then he says in verse 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Friends, isn't that a beautiful thing for God to say to his people in exile? God knew his own thoughts towards these exiled Jews in Babylon. They did not know his thoughts, or perhaps they did not remember his thoughts. So God wanted to state those thoughts in writing so that they would know them. Wouldn't you love to know how God thought of you? Don't you wish he would put it in writing? So you could know, this is how God thinks of me? Wouldn't you love if God would just put it in writing for you? So you would know how he thinks of you? But like maybe he would say something like, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't it beautiful that God says, look, I think a lot of things towards you and you don't know my thoughts because we don't know exactly what God thinks all the time, do we? Most of the time we don't know what God thinks. But God says, I'll write it down for them so that they will know exactly how I think. These are my thoughts towards you. But friends, I just want to back up just for a minute and think about how wonderful it is that God thinks about us at all. You know, um, sometimes I meet somebody who's, you know, well-known or something like that, maybe a famous preacher or something. And sometimes I'm struck by the thought, as you probably are too, I have listened to this person a lot, and I've thought about them a lot. They've never thought about me in a moment of their life. They're, you know, some big, important guy, you know, and I'm just me. Look at them. Look at them. And they, I think about them. They never think about me. You know, isn't it strange to come back on the other side and to just simply say, God thinks about us. Matter of fact, God thinks about us all the time. Look at what it says here in Psalm 40, verse 5. David said, your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. God thinks about you a lot, and he thinks about you favorably. Did you see what it says there in Jeremiah? He says your thoughts are toward you. He thinks toward you. He's not thinking against you. He's thinking toward you. And then he says in verse 11, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Friends, please understand, these exiled Jews lived in the experience of God's judgment. These are people who were ripped away from their homes Every bit of money or possession or valuable that they had was taken away from them. They were by force taken thousands of miles away, thrown into the ancient equivalent of a refugee camp, and they said, okay, now make your way along. 
Wouldn't it be easy for you to think that God was mad at you? Wouldn't it be easy for you to think that God had given up on you? What does God say? No. I have thoughts of peace towards you. I have thoughts of shalom towards you. Not just peace, but well-being. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. My thoughts towards you are full of peace. And in my heart and in my mind, I have a future and a hope for you, God said to them. And friends, let me make something very clear. You know the context here of Jeremiah chapter 29, that this promise was made to ancient Jews under the Babylonian exile but they express the unchanging heart of God toward his people. I have heard people talk about this verse. Look, let's face it, this famous verse, isn't it? You, you probably have it like on a plaque in your home or a refrigerator magnet, on and on. You know, oh, you know, everybody loved Jeremiah 29, 11. Now, I, I've heard some people really criticize that. That verse wasn't given for you. That verse was given for the exiles in Babylon. You have no right to claim that verse. Take away the, take down that refrigerator magnet. Now look, let me say something. Indeed, these were God's thoughts and God's words to ancient Israeli exiles under the old covenant. Absolutely the case. But will anybody dare to believe that God is less favorable to his people under the new covenant? Are you going to tell me that? That in light of Jesus Christ and all he's done and all he is, that somehow God is less favorably disposed to his people? By the way, I have no idea what's going on with this microphone. I, I really apologize. This is, it's dreadful, really. Um, is anybody going to make that case? That, that, oh, yeah. God really felt favorably towards, yeah, let me just do that. Check, check, check. Is anybody really going to tell me that God was this favorably disposed towards the exiles in Babylon, but to the precious blood-bought believers under the new covenant, that, that he has a sharper edge? Friends, if his thoughts towards them were of peace and shalom, if he had a future and a hope for them, what about the child of God under the new covenant? It could only be better. It could only be more wonderful. And so look, I agree. Look, we should know something of the context and kind of shame on us for quoting this verse without knowing anything of the context. But this is what I want to tell you. When you know the context, it's even more wonderful. When you know the context, it's even more precious. And you realize that God can have that grace and that goodness towards us. God has a future and a hope for his people even when they suffer under exile, even when they're under deserved chastening. Maybe some of you feel like, man, I'm going under it. I went astray. I really backslid. And, and man, I'm really getting it from God. He has a future and a hope for you. You think he's forgotten about you? You think that God's so angry, so sore at you that he's given up on you? No way. Never. It's impossible. You are his child. And even if you feel like you're in exile, even if you feel like you're under the pressing hand of God, his thoughts towards you are full of peace, shalom, and a future and a hope. Matter of fact, verse 12, you'll call upon me and go and pray to me and I'll listen to you. You'll seek me, verse 13, and you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. Verse 14, I'll bring you back from your captivity. Friends, that was a future aspect of your, of your uh, future and hope. Listen, those phony baloney prophets were saying, uh, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar's going down. You'll only be there a few months. God says, no, you're going to be there a long time, but I'm going to bring you back. You're going to be there 70 years, but not longer than that. I will bring you back. Don't think I've abandoned you. I think it's a beautiful, a powerful, and a precious word. Verse 15 
Because you have said the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon, therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king who sits on the throne of David, concerning all the people who dwell in this city, and concerning your brethren who have not gone out with you into captivity, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will send them on the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and I will make them like rotten figs that cannot be eaten. They're so bad. And I will pursue them with the sword, with famine, and with the pestilence. I will deliver them to trouble among all the kingdoms of the earth to be a curse, an astonishment, a hissing, and a reproach among all the nations where I've driven them because they have not heeded my word, said the Lord, which I have sent to them. By my servant, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, neither would you heed, says the Lord. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, all you of the captivity, whom I have sent from Jerusalem to Babylon. What's he saying here? He's saying, hey, exiles, I want you to think about the people who are back in Jerusalem. Those people who are back in Jerusalem, they want to seem all spiritual. You know, God's really pleased with us because we haven't been taken away into captivity. All those guys got taken away. They're sinners. God took them away. God says, no, it's just the opposite. By the way, we saw this last week with the illustration of the two baskets of figs. Anyway, you can look at it from last week. What God was saying is, no, you were carried away in captivity first. You are my favored ones. These ones who remain, they will face an incredible judgment. Matter of fact, did you see what they were going to experience? The ones who were left behind, they would become a curse, an astonishment, a hissing, and a reproach among all the nations. Just as it says there in verse 15. Why? Because, excuse me, verse 18, because they have not heeded my words, says the Lord. And so they needed to listen to God's word. Now, verse 21 begins a little different section of the letter. Some people think it was a separate letter. I don't know if it was one long letter or divided up into separate letters. But this is a portion of the letter directed towards an individual. Look at it here, verse 21. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning Ahab, the son of Kaliah, And Zedekiah, the son of Maasiah, who prophesy a lie to you in my name. Behold, I will deliver them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and he shall slay them before your eyes. And because of them, a curse shall be taken up by all the captivity of Judah who are in Babylon, saying, The Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire, because they've done disgraceful things in Israel, have committed adultery with their neighbor's wives, And have spoken lying words in my name, which I have not commanded them. Indeed, I know and am a witness, says the Lord. Look, this isn't complicated. Apparently, there were two false prophets there in Babylon, among the Jews, of course. One was named Ahab, and the other one was named Zedekiah. By the way, two infamous kings in Israel's history. They were named after them. That's a bad start already. And these guys were no doubt the ones prophesying, oh, peace, oh, the captivity is going to last a couple months. Pack your bags. We're going back to Jerusalem. God says, no. Matter of fact, you two guys, Ahab, Zedekiah, you're going to be, you saw it there, you're going to be roasted in the fire of the king of Babylon, as it says in verse 22. That's going to be the curse, people will say. When they really want to give a terrible curse against somebody, they're going to say, the Lord make you like Ahab and Zedekiah. And people go, no, 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 not that. Because God was going to judge them, and they were going to be executed by the king of Babylon. Not only for their false prophecies, also for their false lives, because verse 22 says they've done disgraceful things in Israel and have committed adultery with their neighbor's wives. Verse 24, here's a message to another guy. Again, some people think this is another letter. Some people think it's all part of one letter. Either way, it doesn't really matter. Verse 24. You shall also speak to Shemaiah, the Nehalamite, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, You have sent letters in your name to all the people who are at Jerusalem, to Zephaniah, the son of Messiah, the priest, and to all the priests, saying, The Lord has made you priest instead of Jehodiah the priest, so that there should be officers in the house of the Lord over every man who is demented and considers himself a prophet, that you should put him in prison and in the stocks. Now, therefore, why have you not rebuked Jeremiah of Ananoth, who makes himself a prophet to you? For he has sent us into Babylon, saying, The captivity is long. Build houses and dwell in them and plant gardens and eat their fruit. I don't know how it happened. I don't know if it was through natural means or supernatural means, but Jeremiah had been reading somebody else's mail. Well, no, I'm going to take it back because this was read publicly. That's how we knew it. We know this from verse 29. But there was a guy in Babylon. His name was Shemaiah. 
he wrote a letter back to the priest in Jerusalem, and he told him, stop Jeremiah. Get that man to shut up. Look at what he says. He tells him, stop everyone, verse 25, 26, I mean, every man who's demented and considers himself a prophet. Cha-ching, Jeremiah. The guy walking around with a yoke on his neck all the time for a month at a time? Yeah, him. Shut him up. He likes to wear a yoke? Put him in the stocks. He likes to wear things around his neck? Put an iron collar around his neck. That's the whole thought there. Shut this man up. Verse 29. Now Zephaniah the priest read this letter in the hearing of Jeremiah the prophet. That's how he knew about it. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Send to all those in captivity saying, Thus says the Lord concerning Shemaiah the Nehelamite, Because Shemaiah has prophesied to you and I have not sent him, And he has caused you to trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will punish Shemaiah the Nehelamite and his family. He shall not have anyone to dwell among his people, nor shall he see the good that I will do for my people, says the Lord, because he has taught rebellion against the Lord. Friends, i got to say, these two chapters we've looked at tonight, 28 and 29, and please, don't take me wrong on this. I, I'm not, I, I, hope you'll, I, I hope you won't think I'm saying something I'm not trying to say. When they opposed Jeremiah, God killed them. Isn't that crazy? Hananiah, dead in two months. Ahab and Zedekiah, roasted in a fire. And then this fellow Shemaiah, gone. Now look, I, in no way, In no way, and I'm very serious about this, in no way should a pastor or a leader among God's people ever, ever imply such a thing. Because actually I've heard some guys do it, and it's wrong. Never, It's never right to do such a thing. But I will say this. What it assures us is that God knows how to take care of erring people. He does. Jeremiah didn't have to take care of any of these guys. God knew how to take care of them. Now, Jeremiah wasn't passive. Jeremiah spoke boldly in the name of the Lord. But what I'm just trying to say is Jeremiah didn't have to carry out any violence against these guys whatsoever. It was like, Lord, if it comes to that, you're going to have to do it. I'm not going to do it. And God did. He did it to Hananiah in chapter 28. He did it to Ahab and Zedekiah. And now he does it to Shemaiah. And the worst part of it, look at it there, verse 32. It says there, he says that he will, nor will he see the good that I will do for my people. That's a powerful thing for him to say in verse 32. Nor will he see the good that I will do for my people. Friends, look, I want to be around long enough to see the good that God's going to do for his people. I want to remain faithful. There are some people who say, and believe me, I want you to know honestly, sometimes I think a lot of this is exaggerated, but there are a lot of people really wringing their hands about the state of the church and Christianity and the state of things in the Western world, on and on. Some of this I think is merited. Some of this I think is exaggerated, but whatever. But let me tell you this. I want to stay faithful to God long enough to see him do good to his people once again. And I believe That God has another great outpouring of his spirit to perform. I do. I want to walk with the Lord and be faithful to him long enough to see that come to pass. And to see him do. And what a loss it would be. What a loss it would be for somebody to turn their back on the Lord. To drift away from him so much that God did send something glorious. And you weren't able to enjoy it. Because you didn't walk with him. May it never ever be so with us. Father in heaven, we are amazed that your thoughts towards us are so good. That they're not for evil, but they're for peace and shalom. We're so grateful, Lord, that you give us a future, a hope. So, Lord God, would you please, would you please rebuke whatever voice within us tells us otherwise? Rebuke whatever voice within us tells us that we're under condemnation, that we're not in your favor. 
Lord, I pray that you do that among your people. And Lord, I pray that if there's any who hear it tonight in this room or hear it, Lord, eventually uh, through some other medium, Lord, they're not right with you. They haven't surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. They haven't come to you on the terms of the new covenant. That, God, you would draw them by repentance and faith in Jesus Christ to make those things right so that they could walk in the goodness of your favor and know what it means to have your thoughts toward them for good and not evil. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name.